It's a great day for my channel, as we welcome a distinguished European academic to discuss a pressing issue in Bangladesh. Today, we'll explore how to proceed with reconciliation after the revolution. Given how the Hasina regime has deeply divided the nation and left millions as victim of brutal fascist rule. Allow me to introduce my teacher and friend, Professor Victor. He's a philosopher and professor of philosophy with a keen interest in ethics, particularly at the intersection of ethics and philosophy of religion. Victorus has published works on both Kierkegaard and Levinas. And his current research focuses on philosophical problem of forgiveness. Thank you, Victor, for taking the time to join us. For my audience, I want to clarify that while Victor has uh, followed the revolution in Bangladesh through Western media, but I have also shared the history and narratives that we hold on. Without further delay, let's dive into the first question, Victor, the injustices committed under the fascist regime in Bangladesh have severely impacted the social fabric of the country. Victor, the injustices committed under the fascist regime in Bangladesh have severely impacted the social fabric of the country, placing us at a crucial point in history. The society is divided and there is an immediate urge for revenge from the victims of the regime for obvious reasons. In this context, how do you define reconciliation in a post-fascist Bangladesh? Why it is crucial for the social and political reconstruction of Bangladesh? And what are the dangers of a lack of reconciliation for the stability and future of Bangladesh? Victor, floor is yours. Um, first of all, Vinaki, thank you so much for giving me, me this opportunity to share uh, my thoughts. Indeed, as you as you mentioned, I follow quite closely uh, the situation in Bangladesh, as I believe many here in the West. Uh, not the last reason for that is because I've met you uh, two years ago in, in, uh, and had a chance to converse with you about, uh, about the situation. So um, my thoughts are with, uh, uh, with, with you and uh, with your nation. Mm -hmm. And of course, your your question uh, has many aspects, but I think the the crucial distinction that we have to make when we start thinking about uh, uh, any way to move forward is to uh, to separate revenge and justice. And uh, the thesis that I would like to propose is that these two things are mutually exclusive that if you will seek revenge you will never achieve justice and uh and vice versa if mm -hmm. you want justice you have to give up on the idea of revenge so this is i think crucial for any way to move forward mm -hmm. in situations like that and uh, uh, of course there before we go further with this i think it's a legitimate to question it's a legitimate question to ask but why shouldn't i go for revenge because yeah. especially in situations like that where there's a lot of pain there's a lot of anger there's a lot mm -hmm. of feeling of injustice yes. and and there's also a chance and opportunity to you know to, to claim my stake in, yeah. in 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 the society so to say this is my moment yeah, and I think that uh, so it's understandable, if you will, humanly or at least psychologically, to to think, okay, so for all those things that have been done to me, to my family, to my community, mm -hmm. to people who are dear to me, or even to the ideas that are important to me that I hold dear and which were violated or diminished or mm -hmm. marginalized. Mm -hmm. um, so it's i think it's understandable human and i think we should not dismiss this idea of revenge out of hand mm -hmm. but i think one one crucial problem with revenge is that it does not stop the cycle so what it really uh, entails is that everyone who is in power is entitled to do whatever they want and just to 
take as much as they can to use the mm -hmm. moment, so to speak. Yeah. Which yeah. means that the cycle of violence will never end. Yeah. The cycle of retaliation. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. that that I think is unsustainable in the long run. So anyone who cares about the future of their own society, of the community in which they find this themselves, mm -hmm. they have to find will. And I think it's 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 a question of will and strong discipline to say, okay, the the, the that cycle of retribution stops with me. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very, very crucial here to it's very, very important here to to realize that that does not mean that I will not demand justice. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that I will not demand justice, but I will make sure to di to distinguish uh, between justice and justice revenge. Justice and revenge. Okay. Absolutely. And I think that means that for the most part, I will not be getting what my anger demands. I will not be listening to my anger. I will not be listening to the humiliations I've mm -hmm. I've endured. I will try to put them to one side, so to speak, when I think about justice. And mm -hmm. so I will be thinking about not about myself, but about the perpetrator. And mm -hmm. so the, the crimes that he or she or they have done and mm -hmm. what they deserve for those crimes. So in mm -hmm. many ways, I will be trying to be not the victim, but the judge. Not the victim, but the judge. Okay. okay. And, and it's very, very important that there is no tradition. Or I think, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll be, I'll be on the safe side. Perhaps there is a tradition, but all the traditions known to me, they never allow a victim to be a judge. Yes. For the, for the one reason, because victim yep. is violated, and it yep. cannot be uh, unbiased, so to speak. It, it's very, very difficult. Yeah. And so I think that's 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 the strategy which I would be pursuing, trying to think, how do I become a judge? But that means I cannot without think. being biased. Uh, yes, uh, but that being a judge means being unbiased. You know, otherwise you cannot judge. Yeah. You know, yeah. If, uh, so, but that means I have to put. And that, that doesn't mean stop being a victim. I think there is a place for being a victim so for uh living through your suffering mm -hmm. uh, acknowledging the pain that you had mm -hmm. but realizing that <laughs> this cannot be my guide in thinking about what shall be done mm -hmm. with uh, the perpetrators of crimes mm -hmm. it's not the victim's role to decide victim will demand for the most part revenge and that's not what we need revenge for the okay. reasons Yes, for the reasons that we discussed, I think what we should demand is justice rather than revenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, so and the, the 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 way you put forward the idea of uh, becoming a judge rather than being a victim. So, don't you think that it's a kind of theoretical proposition, which is very difficult to achieve? Well, of course, it's a it's a theoretical proposition which is very difficult to achieve. But I think. You know, uh, as many things uh, first exist in theory, and then we try to uh, put them in practice because they we believe that uh, these theoretical propositions could work rather than the other ones that uh, uh, have not worked in the past. So, of course, it is a theoretical proposition, but I wouldn't say, and I would agree that it's difficult to achieve. But I would say that it's it doesn't mean that it's impossible. I think we have communities. And examples of communities and societies that have gone through uh, certain divisions. There are, you know, histories of civil wars are exa always examples of divided communities that after that have to go through certain processes of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And there is no uh, society which would come to reconciliation through the means of revenge. Well, uh, that was exactly my next question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, can you can you share uh, some examples of uh, other countries and communities and societies who successfully pursued that um, idea of being the judge without being biased? You know. Well, the the first uh, society that comes to my mind is uh, South Africa after apartheid. Well, of course, okay. we had. Uh, a long history of uh, racial discrimination, which was structural mm -hmm. and politically um, legalized and established in mm -hmm. South Africa. And after it was abolished, 
South African uh, society had to go through um, the processes of reconciliation, mm -hmm. which was extremely difficult because uh, the processes that went on during the apartheid era were uh, so pervasive, uh, uh, and there was no South African who was untouched by those pro processes, it, okay. it, and it lasted for decades. Yes. Uh, so, of course, it's there's always a mm, a possibility to to and and it, it 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 would be silly to deny that you know it's not everything rosy in South Africa at the moment. There are still racial tensions and mm. and whatnot. But I think uh, in general, uh, there is a broad agreement that South Africa has gone through a really powerful transformation in the last three decades or so mm -hmm. uh, by trying to deal with uh, with its past and with the uh, with the division of the society that was going on and which uh, that was rather violent and aggressive uh, in uh, during the period of uh, of uh, apartheid and uh, there are many studies done what uh, about mm, the processes that took place and about the dynamics uh, that uh, that occurred in south africa mm -hmm. but i uh, so we can't really you know uh, uh, disclose it in full but at least to my mind what seems was uh, crucial uh, uh, in South Africa, it was that uh, to, to achieve reconciliation was yeah. that first and foremost in South Africa, there was a demand to tell the full story. Okay. And so the, the committee in South Africa was called for the Committee for Truth and Reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And truth was a non-negotiable condition mm -hmm. to, uh, for the society to move forward. Mm -hmm. And there were lots and lots and lots of practices how in local communities people would get together, both uh, mm -hmm. uh, black and white, and yeah. would just tell their stories. And it is—is so is it something? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, is it something yeah. that uh, uh, you 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 told us uh, transitional justice? Well, trans well, I wouldn't call it a transitional justice in 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 in. Okay, uh, and we'll go back. We'll, we'll come yeah, back to yeah. this point after. Yeah, maybe we we yeah. can come back to this. Yeah. But I think here it's it's perhaps you could interpret it as a, a way towards justice as a necessary mm -hmm. condition. But I think uh, even without giving it this terminological bent, I think mm -hmm. it's it's pretty clear what was taking place in the sense that. First and foremost, what the victims want is the acknowledgement that some harm has been done to them, some yeah. acknowledgement from their own society and okay. or community on a on a on a more uh, on a smaller scale. And so, it is extremely important for the victims to give them voice, to give them voice, so that okay. they are allowed to share what really happened to them. And yeah. also, I think, on the other side. It is extremely important to give voice also or to the possibility to the perpetrators if mm -hmm. they are willing to acknowledge mm -hmm. what they have done wrong, that this space is created where all these stories can be shared. Because I think it's extremely important for, uh, in order to move forward for, the, for those who who committed some crimes, who violated oh. some uh, some laws and or some communal uh, principles, that they can be allowed to, uh, that they are allowed to acknowledge that, to acknowledge okay. to their own community in order to move forward. Okay, so, so sorry to interrupt. So if I understand you well, so you are proposing that the first, we need to give voice to the victims, number one. They have to tell their full story, what, what did happen to them. And when, if possible, we need to engage also the perpetrators into this Absolutely. process to, 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 to acknowledge the fact and uh, to say they are part of the story. So that means it becomes a creating a space uh, for, uh, for telling the story from both parties, for all the stakeholders, be it victim, be it perpetrator, uh, in presence of the civil society. Am I right? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And okay. especially it's important in in small local communities where very often uh, everyone knows what's been what has been done. Everyone knows the crimes that have been committed and everyone knows by whom they were committed. But okay. because of the regime of oppression that was in place mm -hmm. uh, before the change, that was never articulated in the communal space. Mm -hmm. So it remains private knowledge. And I think it's extremely important that this has, is being articulated in the community, in the town hall, or in the in the town square, or in the just a gathering of, of community leaders, where okay. people get to one truth, so it's not left unspoken. It's extremely important for the victims, and it's been shown by a raft of research, just to be able to share the pain that they had in uh, with the okay. with their community, and but also for the perpetrators who have. Uh, who are ready to acknowledge that they committed crimes or that they have done something wrong. Perhaps it's not a legal crime, but something that they think their community would not approve of. So that they can share that too. And they can say sorry, or they can just acknowledge their guilt. So that space, I think, is extremely important. And that creates a space of conversation, which would create this connective tissue within the community and would start the healing this would start creating the ties uh, between these normally two groups that I div divided, but sometimes there's more groups than two. Uh, and we had countries where there were multi-ethnic conflicts, like in the Balkans, let's say. So that possibility of just sharing mm -hmm. loud in in a, in a if you will in a safe space in the space yeah. where uh, you are in a communal space. In the communal space, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's yeah. extremely important. It's a condition, and uh, that that I think is 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 fundamental. And it's important to say so far when we speak about the truth, about just articulating, we yeah. haven't said anything about what uh, should be done to the perpetrators. Should it be justice, uh, a court, uh, revenge? Uh, what should yeah. nothing about that. And mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that. That question should not arise. But I think when we talk about what is a must, I think the space where people can articulate what really happened to them in okay. their own subjective way, I think is crucial. Uh, I have a small question, you know. Uh, so that's the best possible scenario that, you know, the victims are telling their story and the perpetrators are acknowledging that fact that, yes, they did wrong. But in uh, if the perpetrators they don't agree to disclose their part or they don't agree to acknowledge their part so this this is the another another scenario you know so how should we proceed in this scenario well i think uh, of course this is an ideal scenario in the sense that uh, uh, both sides come together and yeah. and talk but uh, and of course it's not that easy. So we're discussing what could be ideal, but I think in uh, uh, even if the perpetrators or all perpetrators and they all of them will never be ready to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. Some will always deny the, the mm -hmm. guilt, or some yeah. of them will yeah. say, "I've never done anything wrong. What's wrong? Yeah. Actually, what's taking place now is wrong." Mm -hmm. So that, of course, is a uh, uh, that will happen. But I think uh, uh, even if we do not get all the perpetrators to to come and 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 share i think uh we still will do a lot of good work when we will allow the victims to to share uh what really happened it's therapeutic to begin with for the victims just to be able to to articulate what really happened and to know that they're not alone in their uh, mm -hmm. in their pain in in their grief that their community their society acknowledges that okay. that what happened to them was not right, was wrong. Okay. I think even without the perpetrators, and as it happened, and as it, it continues to happen very often, when victims start speaking, very often the perpetrators only then start to realize the, the real severity of their actions and okay. the real harm that, that has been done. And so it triggers also something in them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I can I can recall one very iconic photograph that you know 
um, uh, the Americans are showing the photographs and the movies um, in front of their captured German soldiers, Nazi soldiers, after Second World War. And most of them I have seen, and the faces of the Nazi soldiers, they are hiding their faces, you know. They, when they see what they have done, they are hiding their faces. So, yeah, that can be one option. Uh, well, uh, opening up the space and, uh, well, telling the story and acknowledgement of the story uh, is uh, first part, first stage. Then what next? What about the justice? I think it's... Uh... Uh, uh, who uh, could be helpful to us in this scenario, and you already mentioned the uh, Nazi soldiers, uh, it's, uh, it's the experience of the uh, post-war Germany. And uh, I highly recommend the German philosopher Karl Jaspers, who wrote a book immediately after the war on German guilt, mm -hmm. trying to realize really what, are, what is the extent of, of guilt and what kind of guilt. Uh, should Germans feel? Mm -hmm. So he distinguished or he proposed that there are four types of guilt. And okay. those which are important to us in this case are two which he thinks come uh, to us from outside because he thinks the other two are uh, the feelings of inner guilt and they do not really concern uh, the outside world, uh, including the community. So mm -hmm. those two types of guilt that come from the outside that is imposed upon us he thinks, uh, uh, he calls them, one is a criminal guilt and the other is political guilt. And mm -hmm. criminal guilt is, is very straightforward, is the guilt that, that you get for violating the laws uh, mm -hmm. that are um, in, in your country mm -hmm. uh, uh, or in, in the legal system in which you find yourself. And mm -hmm. so it seems uh, obvious to me, although I'm really outside observer, that some of the actions that were uh, committed by police force and intelligence services and, and uh, other institutions in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. they were violating the laws that were at the time in place in Bangladesh. Of course. And, of course. and that means that if we talk about justice, mm -hmm. that they should be punished according to the laws of the country. And it should, I think it's, it's the demand of justice that mm -hmm. those people who, who committed crimes mm -hmm. have to get the punishment according yeah. to those crimes. Yeah, and actually who are engaged in enforced disappearance and uh, extrajudicial killing and... Uh, so absolutely. Of course. Yeah. Uh, secret prisons and, yes. and, uh, and things like that. And it's, mm -hmm. I, you know... It, it, even to the extent of uh, intimidation and 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 uh, etc so yeah. illegal detention uh, things like that and i think mm -hmm. it is in the interest of the whole uh, bangladesh society mm -hmm. that uh, crimes like that are punished but i mean punished in a legal way not in a okay. personal way not in the sense of revenge i don't yeah. like you i yeah. if i were a citizen of bangladesh Mm -hmm. I would like to think that I would be demanding mm -hmm. that it is strictly legal procedure, that those okay. who committed crimes are punished for those crimes, because that promises to us a society in which everyone is, hold, is held accountable mm -hmm. in front of the law. And that mm -hmm. means also in front of the whole society. So mm -hmm. I think it is, it does, uh, what we spoke about telling the truth and mm -hmm. being able to acknowledge your crimes and mm -hmm. in front of your community i don't think that this is an uh, this absolves you from uh, legal repercussions i think it's the opposite uh, one thing is to try and reconcile with your own community and to acknowledge in front of them as members of your own community the things that you've done but also the other the, the other aspect of it is that you committed actual crimes and these crimes have legal, legal repercussions. And I think uh, Bangladeshi legal system should pursue that because that will give uh, a feeling uh, to Bangladeshi society and a promise to Bangladeshi society that justice works, that justice is in place in Bangladesh, but precisely justice, not mm -hmm. revenge. And the other type of, of uh, uh, guilt, uh, guilt that uh, Karl Jaspers proposed, 
uh, that Cal Jaspers proposes is political guilt. Mm -hmm. And this type of guilt, he says, is, uh, uh, is the guilt that everyone who is a member of, of certain political community mm -hmm. uh, uh, had committed. Uh, yeah. That that member yeah. of that political community has because uh, something that uh, has been done in the name of that political community. So let's say in Karl Iaspers's view, every mm -hmm. German has some political guilt for the Nazi crimes because uh, the Nazi regime was doing that in the name of German political body of German political community. Mm -hmm. In the same sense, you could say now in Russia, what is Russia doing in Ukraine, uh, mm -hmm. waging an aggressive and unprovoked war against Ukraine, that every Russian citizen has a portion of political guilt for that because mm -hmm. it's being done in the name of Russian political community or in the name of Russian state. Okay, okay. understood. Yeah. But how to deal yeah. with this political guilt? Well, I think uh, political guilt, uh, the, the importance here, and uh, of course, a lot of people criticize the aspects for that, is that, you know, perhaps we should use a, a more a less charged uh, term in this context, uh, not guilt, but responsibility. But in this case, Jasper says that every member of political community is responsible for what is happening. And mm -hmm. so he would say that, you know, it, for the situation that mm -hmm. is now in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. politically are responsible all members of political uh, community Hasina, of Bangladesh. Hasina's party, yeah, Ahmed League yes. and Hasina's yes. party. Uh, so. Yes, and I think what he would say is, of course, that it doesn't mean that everyone is responsible or guilty equally, mm -hmm. because it also depends on the political power you have mm -hmm within yeah, your the, political community yeah but in a way you know what happened in the last month or so in bangladesh mm -hmm. it is precisely that it is bangladeshi citizens taking responsibility for their own political community and saying you know we need change because this mm -hmm. is what is taking place is not okay mm -hmm. so perhaps responsibility here is a better term than guilt because guilt implies doing something wrong Mm -hmm. But uh, Jaspers was thinking, uh, just to remind you, after World War II, so for him, of course, the prevalent example was the uh, German society of the, of the Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, he held every German, at least, of course, partially, but mm -hmm. guilty for the Nazi crimes. So you have to, you kind of, you have to carry the burden for the, for the things that have been done. And in that sense, I think what he would imply is that, of course, the usual argument is that uh, a lot of people couldn't do nothing because, of course, the police power or the assess in the Nazi Germany case or uh, other state apparatus would prohibit you. But Jasper says, but uh, yes, that's true. But at the same time, a lot of Germans knew what's taking place, but they didn't do anything. They gave up, so to speak, in advance. They, mm -hmm. they turned away. And I think it, we can all recognize that. You know, I uh, was born uh, in Lithuania when it was still occupied by Soviet Union. And early 80s, Lithuanian society was very peaceful. Not, not really, there were no really protests against Soviet occupation, although you wouldn't find a lot of people who would like, who would have liked it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in, in, in a way, of course, we were all responsible for that regime going on because we didn't do enough as a collective body. So mm -hmm. I think that's what Jaspers means by collective, by political guilt. Mm -hmm. And you get that guilt in the sense, just because you are a member of, of certain political community. And so mm -hmm. in, in that sense, every Bangladeshi citizen is, is responsible for the situation in which Bangladesh finds itself. And I think it shouldn't be read as something accus accusatory, although it mm -hmm. could be, but I think it's also an invitation to to feel responsible for mm -hmm. uh, for for your own community and also for the future uh, towards which your community will go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you said four crimes. So number one is criminal uh, obligation, uh, political obligation or political guilt. And what are the other two? The other two are in a 
forms of guilt. So one is the guilt of conscience and the guilt of conscience, which means that I just feel guilty for something that I have done. And I, I just have this, you know, inner feeling or inner voice. Very often, uh, it can be something that, you know, others don't think that uh, you should feel guilty about, but for some reason you feel guilty. You think I shouldn't have done this. That's not right. And it's just kind of in a dialogue that you have. So that's uh, something that no one can put on you from outside, but it's just your inner moral compass. Sometimes we say, and mm -hmm. uh, so that's the third type. And the fourth type is what uh, Kaliaspus calls a metaphysical guilt. A metaphysical guilt for him is just the guilt of, of 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 being a human being in 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 the sense that you all in the sense that you are aware of your own limitations and that you you never do enough you always can do much what, what you don't and so mm -hmm. it's kind of this uh guilt of, of 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 being a human being and and knowing that there's so much in the world that could be fixed and of course you 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 could be doing more but you are not uh, and in the Asperger's view, that's just a uh, universal human condition. So that's the, uh, in very, like, very broad terms, what's metaphysical guilt. Or, or something like uh, Israel is bombing Gaza and uh, I'm looking at uh, this bombing and doing nothing. Something like this? Something like that. So, yeah, yes, you could say, so in Lithuania, maybe this example is not, uh, uh, is not, uh, uh, that uh, prevalent, but I, I, when I was talking about uh, about this with some friends a few days ago, the example I used was South Sudan. So South Sudan in in Lithuania is, I, I believe, a lot of people wouldn't be able to point where it is, and so we kind of know that something bad is taking place there, mm -hmm. and we just don't think about. It. And the moment we start thinking about, it, we feel guilty because, of course, we should be <laughs> because mm -hmm. the, it's. People, innocent people are dying or suffering, and as humans, we feel solidarity with them. But at some, at, there's also another thing to be said. As humans, we are limited. We cannot carry all the suffering in the world on our individual shoulders. So we also protect ourselves. But that does not absolve us from this metaphysical guilt. I think that's what roughly Jaspers uh, has in mind when he when he says that so we let, have let this. Let us put this in Bangladesh perspective because because the Hasuna regime has been in power for the last 15 years and uh, there has been atrocities and crimes against humanity and there are people uh, who say that, you know, it's not my problem. You know, they had their good life and uh, they said that it's not my problem. They never raised their voice. So can you say that this is a metaphysical guilt? Uh, I, I wouldn't say so, because I think for Jaspers, this metaphysical guilt is something that uh, the person feels only within themselves. So it's an in, in, inner feeling of guilt. So sometimes I can assume that some people don't have that feeling. So there's something, some I would say there's some disorder with them. They lack mm -hmm. empathy, let's say, or they lack interest in in uh, uh, anything outside of their own individual existence and i don't think it's a normal approach to 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 your own existence so but i can presume that there are people who do not feel that guilt mm -hmm. but metaphysical guilt is not imposed uh, from the outside okay that's from the outside, from everything that should come yes. from within okay yes okay yes I, at least in jasper's view and uh, okay. i yeah okay so and what is the fourth guilt so fourth is the is the metaphysical. The third was the guilt of conscience. The oh, guilt of conscience. Okay. Yeah. So it's a moral guilt. What we typically call moral guilt when you when you feel guilty for having done something wrong, for okay. having done something wrong, okay. and it's also in a feeling. So sometimes you do something and you feel ah I shouldn't have done this. And sometimes you talk to people, your friends, and say ah, I did that. And friends say don't worry about it. It's okay. Mm. But you still have this feeling that you, it's just, yeah. I, I messed it up, yeah. And I think that it's very typical. It's very recognizable. We have that, but it's also in a in a feeling. So moral guilt and also metaphysical guilt. Okay, now, now very crucial question: Why should I go for reconciliation? How should it? 
um, uh, the process of reconciliation helps a country to progress, uh, helps a country's economy, helps a country's community. Why should we go for it? Well, I think it's a question of survival. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, you have to ask yourself a question, do you want Bangladesh to exist as a yeah. community, as an entity? And if you want uh, Bangladesh to exist as a community, you have to find some sort of peace, some sort of peaceful coexistence. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, otherwise, you'll be always at war with each other. And at some point, everything will collapse. So it will it will be if we talk about politics, it will be eaten by neighboring countries divided and and or and what or occupied the annexed. And we've seen in history many examples of that when uh, uh, a country uh, uh, a conflict with itself with an inner conflict is is uh, is being taken apart by outside forces too. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's a question of survival. It, if we want, if you want, if Bangladeshi political community wants to uh, exist right. as a community, mm -hmm. it has to find a way of how to live uh, together, how to live together, which is not a constant um, uh, division and constant conflict. Conflict mm -hmm. in the sense of winner takes all. You know, that's that there is this concept of, you know, uh, that when we have a conflict so we'll find out who is the winner and then the winner is takes everything and the loser gets nothing mm -hmm. and that's the mm -hmm. um uh, that's a very unproductive way of resolving conflicts because mm -hmm. that loser is always unhappy so he's mm -hmm. always or, or them they're always waiting for their chance for revenge and when they mm -hmm. win then they try to take everything and, and so I think it's a much more sustainable way of resolving a conflict is trying to find a compromise, a compromise where you know we we acknowledge each other's differences. We, we acknowledge that we are not all the same. We have different values. We have different fears. We have different traumas. We have different plans. Mm -hmm. So I think if we if if you want Bangladesh to Exist, exist and to have and to also and also to have prosperous future uh it, it is a question of how to to find peace uh, within the community within the community and that peace shouldn't be a piece of where a winner oppresses the loser mm -hmm. because that tension will remain and at some point it will be like a sand clock it mm -hmm. will be reversed and the loser will become the winner and it mm -hmm. will be uh, it will be uh, an endless uh, cycle of violence. Exactly. So we are coming to an end. So my last question is, um, given the fact that you know the history of Bangladesh and uh, the recent history of the revolution and uh, what uh, the La Paz regime, Sheikh Hasina regime did uh, with its own people. So what is the concrete first step that you recommend to initiate the process of reconciliation? I think it, it has to, to uh, uh, what has to happen, I think uh, the trust in political institution has to be brought back. And so normally in cases like that, there's some form of uh, uh, government of national unity is mm -hmm. created where a broad umbrella of different political actors and different political forces agree to work together mm -hmm. so that the political community can regain trust in political process, in political institutions, in institutions of justice like courts, in uh, institutions like uh, police that have the, uh, the power of, uh, uh, to use force. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely important because then you can get citizens on board and then you can uh, agree on on uh, the uh, the way forward. So mm -hmm. on foundational documents, I'm I'm not sure. I don't know enough about Bangladesh to know if, if a new constitution is needed or if, if it was just a complete misapplication of the old one. But this is for uh, political actors to to decide in Bangladesh, but, uh, but I think it's crucial that as many um, uh, forces are at the table, so no one monopolizes uh, mm -hmm. this process, and it's difficult. 
it is extremely difficult because precisely it's difficult because very very different people uh, with very different ideas get uh, get to sit at the table but it's crucial uh, because it will give legitimacy to the whole process and it will help to regain trust and at the same time i think it's extremely important that uh, so on on the local level in the local communities that mm -hmm. people get the chance to speak get the chance to tell their truth that mm -hmm. uh, a certain uh, uh, level of trust is recreated on these on these in, on this local level mm -hmm. uh, and this is perhaps even harder because it's not a it's not one process there are millions of processes like that every village should have a certain certain process like that but mm -hmm. i think it's crucial and so uh, i would think that perhaps not the government but perhaps civic society mm -hmm. could introduce um uh, infrastructure like that some uh, citizen assemblies or or meeting groups just to tell their story so that people can articulate to each other and to themselves what really happened it's i think it's 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 crucial also to start rebuilding the connective tissue mm -hmm. in these local communities and rebuilding uh, rebuilding trust and it's extremely painful process it's an extremely painful process precisely because these people they know each other on local level for whole their of their lives their families have known each other so to tell each other painful things it's it's very very difficult but it's also therapeutic and also it rebuilds uh, it rebuilds uh, trust which is crucial for uh, for the community because then this uh, this cycle of violence can finally stop uh well my last question given the fact of historic conflicts in bangladesh starting from 1947 and then 71 our citizens the people of bangladesh might think that the process of reconciliation may not work in bangladesh what message of hope or advice would you give to those who fear that reconciliation might not work in bangladesh you know in in uh, in europe uh, one example i i i keep coming back so uh, uh, it makes me very curious is the example of Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, where I, I, I don't know, maybe it's it's not a, a, a famous story in, in uh, Bangladesh, but Northern Ireland is, is a territory on the island of Ireland, which belongs to United uh, Kingdom. And it had a a long long history of uh, communal violence because there was a religious division and ethnic division in the community and uh, there was a lot of terrorism and it seemed like an unsolvable uh situation because there were so many grievances uh, and it it was it, it really looked like an endless uh, cycle of, of violence because each community had a lot of stories of pain and it seemed impossible uh, to overcome that and to forgive. Uh, it was in Europe for decades. It was an example of, of a completely unsolvable conflict. And in the 90s of last century, uh, uh, something happened. And uh, uh, finally, they managed to get the leaders of both communities at the table and to put aside for a moment uh the grievances the the pain but uh, and to start thinking about the future and so i'm not trying to say that they solved all problems there's a lot of ethnic tension and religious tension in northern line island but basically terrorism and uh, uh, the violence stopped for now three decades it's it's gone it, of course, it can always come back, and the uh, uh, people who follow that will tell me lots of examples of on on the on an everyday level that it's 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 not all rosy. But the terrorism, the terrorist attacks, they have stopped, and and it's, it's somehow that gives me a lot of hope because at the time 
I remember when I was growing up, it, it was an example of an unsolvable problem, of an unsolvable problem. It, it looked like it, it can't be solved. And uh, we certainly are at a better moment now than we were uh, three decades ago. So that gives me hope. I think it's, it, everything is possible. But of course, it, what it would be really silly of me is to say that it's easy, because it's not. It's very, very hard. And so I think what is what my advice would be to if I could give any advice because you know who am I but my if I could give an advice my advice would be just prepare that it's going to be really really painful but you know that's the price you have to pay if you want to be the generation that stops the violence mm -hmm. you know those who will stop the violence they will have to pay the highest price in a way because they will have to uh, to stop seeking revenge and that they will have to look at their pain, so to speak, from a side. And that's, that's very, very difficult. But I think it's worth it. You know, it's worth it if you think about the future of your own country, if you think about the future of the next generations, if you think about the future of your children and grandchildren. Do you, what kind of country, what kind of community do you want to leave them? Mm -hmm. Do you want to leave the country that you got, that you inherited from? Your grandparents or maybe you want to leave a country which doesn't have that 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 level of violence and that level of of uh, mistrust and so it, it is hard but i think it's it, it's worth the price thank you victor for your time and presence and uh, possibly this is for the first time in bangladesh we have been discussing about the process of reconciliation its challenges and uh, how it can impact the future generation. Thanks, Victor, for your uh, advice, time, and insight. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.